are wolves among the sheep. Yeah. Now, I'm somebody who enjoys, or would like to enjoy, foraging. My drink here this morning is homemade elderflower cordial. And we just went and picked some elderflower and... Yeah, it's very good. It's got a bit of sugar in it, my word. But, the thing is, when you go foraging, a little knowledge can be dangerous. Now, I have an interest in mushrooms. I don't eat them because they're disgusting. <laughs> but I've got an interest in them. I find them fascinating and I would love to know more about them because I'm a fun guy. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. There won't be any more of those. But anyway, seriously, foraging for mushrooms can really be dangerous because some mushrooms look alike and one could be utterly deadly and the other one could be totally edible. Yeah. And it only is the expert who can really identify the difference between them. And friends, it's again like this within the church that we need to be able to determine the difference between wolves and sheep. Who's going to sustain and give life? Who's going to help us in our life and our circumstances? Who's going to give us energy Who's going to cause harm? Who's going to drain us of our, of our energy, cause damage, or damage our faith? And Jesus uses the illustration next of fruit, good fruit and bad fruits, of good trees and bad trees, because it's something we can all understand. A tree can be, a tree's health can be determined by the fruit that it produces. I remember walks up Breeden Hill as a, as a youngster. God, that. <laughs> Dragged around Breeden Hill on these long walks I was. And uh, I remember one particular place. We came to this stone barn, Cotswold Stone Barn, and there was a, an egg plum. Do you remember that one? No? Okay, well, I do. There was an egg plum tree there, and um, often we'd sort of stop off at this tree and I'd eat some of the egg plums, and it was like a nice treat if you were there at the right time of the year. But then I remember that one time, the tree was on its way out, it was dying, and the fruit was no good. And this is the sort of thing that we are reminded to look out for. So how can we apply what Jesus is saying? That when we're looking for sheep and wolves, we need to look for character and integrity. We need to look for ethics versus hypocrisy. We need to look for righteousness versus unrighteousness. And so how are we going to begin our observations? By con how are we going to do this? We do so by considering the fruit of the Spirit described in Galatians 5. That fruit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. So these are the things that we can weigh a person by. Does someone show genuine love? Not, that not only cares, but continues to care when things are hard. I know I can be a right pain in the derriere sometimes. <laughs> Olivia still cares for me. Do we care for one another when things are hard? Does a person demonstrate joy in Christ? Joy that comes from knowing, but a deep, deep knowing of the Lord. Deep, deep knowing that we're saved. Deep, deep knowledge that we are redeemed and bought by the blood of Christ. Do we demonstrate that joy in Christ? Does a person give out and pour out peace? Does someone have that sense of inner peace and calm? that they can only receive from the Lord. That peace that transcends understanding. Do they bring their peace into situations or are they people of conflict and division? Does a person have patience? Or has everything got to happen now? Otherwise they get frustrated and angry. <laughs> because there are times when God will say, wait still. There are times when God will say, not yet. And there are times when he's going to say, go for it. 
Is a person genuinely kind? Or are they only kind when they're in trouble? I know I struggle with this sometimes. Liz, Liz will say to me sometimes, you're just so nice when you're in church, but why are you so grumpy? <laughs> So I don't always get this right. I'm not saying we're all going to get these right. But I think it's the multiple of indicators that give us the warnings. Is a person generous? Not only with finances, but with their time or with their words. Or is a person tight? And Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, he commends the church for their generosity and he encourages it to continue. Does a person demonstrate that they are filled with faith? Faithfulness towards God. Do they believe what Jesus says and teaches? Do they believe that what is said about the kingdom of God is true? Do they have the faith to practice what they preach and put into action all that they say? Does a person demonstrate gentleness? And I'm not talking gentle as in touchy-feely gentleness. But and I recognise that some of us are a bit heavy-handed, clumsy and heavy-footed. And that's okay. But we're talking about gentleness with others. Watch how a person speaks to one another. I heard that one day a, uh, a business chief exec, a high flyer, he invited two Oxford graduates out for dinner. Uh, they'd interviewed for a job and he, he was trying to decide which one to take. And he invited them out for dinner and uh, at the end of the meal he said to them, um, you know, you've got the job and you haven't. Mm -hmm. The guy who got the job said, well, thank you very much. See you on Monday or whatever it was. And the guy who did it was like, well, can I have some feedback? Why, why didn't I get the job? You know, we both ordered, we both ate politely, da 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 and he said, the guy who got the job treated the waiters and the waiting staff with consideration, was grateful, and treated them well. Whereas you just sort of demanded and clicked your fingers, as it were. How do we handle others? How do we see those that, you know, do we see people as beneath us? I mean, does a person demonstrate self-control? Do we fly off the rails? Do we throw tantrums? Is somebody able to control their tongue or are they petulant and ignorant? These are some of the characteristics that we need to be looking for. You see, people who are spirit-filled are people of unity. But unity doesn't mean seeing everything in the same way, but it means that we bring people together rather than driving apart. And friends, when we're looking for the wolves amongst the sheep, be watchful, because character is key. If a person is being false, their, their character will betray their words. False prophets can claim with confidence and convincing assurance that their thoughts and opinions are of God, and they demand them to be heard, but ultimately, a bombastic bags of wind we would be wise to avoid. So we need to be testing the truth of people's words by how they behave. Amen? Jesus' words later on, he says that there are some who will call out to him as Lord, Lord. And that he will reply, I do not know you. And it seems challenging, doesn't it? It seems cruel. And it may even ask us the question, well, how do I know that I'm going to enter the kingdom of heaven? And we're going to get to that later. But several years ago, uh, some of my friends, the you know, Manchester United football fans, sometimes. <laughs> Come on, we can move them, that's all right. Um, I'm a Liverpool fan, so I was there. Oh, under pressure. <laughs> Let's not move the Liverpool. <laughs> anyway, so I was taken along to Old Trafford, and uh, Manchester United were going to be playing against Inter Milan, and it was a friendly game and whatnot. And my friends, they're all kitted up in their United shirts and, and this. And we got there nice and early to the ground. And um, 
As we were there early and waiting for things to happen and whatnot, we decided to go round to the players' entrance and uh, gather with the other fans who were waiting there. We saw Ryan Giggs walk in and Paul Scholes and Cristiano Ronaldo and, mm -hmm. and all these names that some of us have heard of. And um, mm -hmm. some of the fans were calling out to them, Ronaldo, Ronaldo, of course they wanted their autographs and things like that. And my friends were in the kit and they all dressed up appropriately and they didn't get to go into the dressing room. My friends, they knew the names of all the players, they knew the name of the manager, and they didn't get to go on the pitch. And let's be honest, it's because they weren't part of the team. They hadn't studied under the manager, they hadn't done all the work and the training and the commitment. They didn't know how what the game plan was going to be and things like that. And so they didn't get in because they weren't part of the team. My friends, in the final reckoning, when we come face to face with God, our words are going to mean nothing. We can call out Lord, Lord, but unless we spend time and walked with God, we've spent time in the presence of God, if we've been obedient to his commands, unless we've done that, why would we think that we're going to be allowed to enter in? Last time I spoke, I spoke, I mentioned about being weighed on the scales and being found wanting. But that Jesus would come and stand on that scale in your place. He's got to be in relationship with you just as you need to be in relationship with him. If he's going to step in and take our place. You see, being disciples of Christ is more than just attending church. It's more than having knowledge of the scriptures. It's more than being a deacon or a group leader. But it's about being known by God, by spending time in his presence and walking in obedience to him. <coughs> I just want to remind you guys that there's nothing that you can do that will make God love you more. And there's nothing that you can do that will make God love you Less. God simply seeks our obedience and our willingness to follow Him. But in this part of the passage, it, it challenges me in a different way because did anybody notice that Jesus was saying, Hey, you know, you're going to come to heaven and you're going to say, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name. I healed this person in your name, I cast out the demons in your name, I cured the sick in your name. And he says, I, but I didn't know you. And he challenges me because what that's saying is that there's people out in the world that the, the name of Christ is powerful, right? Mm -hmm. That the name of God has power to do things. It's his name that does these things. It's not me or you or anybody, but it is God. The world were applying that, and yet they weren't walking in relationship. And so the challenge to me with this is that we, as a church, should be expecting to see signs and wonders and miracles. That if we are those who claim to walk with Jesus, to know him, if we are those who claim to be his disciples, shouldn't we see these things in our churches? I'm not saying we've got to be weird and wacky. I do believe that we have the opportunity to have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at work in our lives, producing fruit in us. And that fruit being patience and joy just as much as healings and miracles. said earlier that we'd answer the question, how do we know whether we will enter the kingdom of God? And perhaps we might ask, how can we be sure? I think back to the times of slavery. But when people were bought and sold as slaves, 
But those slaves could only receive freedom when their master says, you give them freedom. But some of those slaves, they had such a good relationship with their master, such a good relationship with the family, and that they knew there was provision, that they wanted to stay. Now, that wasn't common. We've all heard of history and how awful scenarios were. But when those servants wanted to stay with a, with a family and stay with their master, they would say to them, I want to stay, I want to be part of yours, and they would become bond servants. It was a choice. They bonded themselves to their masters. They were bonded to their masters through the relationship that they had with them to this point. The way that they've been treated, the way that they've gotten to know them. And I believe it's like this in the kingdom of God. You see, doing God's will constantly and consistently is the only marker, the only indication of a person's authentic relationship with God. Jesus' own description in this passage tells us that we can have signs and wonders, but without obedience to God and God's will, God's plan, God's purposes, all you have is a stage show, all you have is a performance, a form of entertainment. But it's all an illusion. And it demonstrates our delusion. So how can we be obedient? What is it that we need to do to demonstrate our obedience to God? To be assured of our admittance to the kingdom of heaven? Jesus tells us in Matthew 22 that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. And this is why, as Pershaw Baptist Church, our motto, or our saying, whatever you want to call it, is love in action. That's what we seek to be and do here, that we seek to do that by loving God. By loving others in the world around us and by loving ourselves in light of who Christ says you are. The love is agape. The sacrificial, the serving kind of love. It's only when we seek these things, when we put these into action to love God, with all that we are. To love others despite how annoying we can be. I hold my hand up. At times I can be hard to love. We need to love one another. And then do we love ourselves? Not in an arrogant kind of way, but in a way that says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That God knew me before time began and I was in his plan. That although I'm a Goldilocks, I know that I'm created in God's image. I'm pretty sure we've all got things about our physicality that we don't love. Made in God's image, perhaps. We need to put these things into practice. Loving God, loving others, loving ourselves in public and in private. And only then, only then can we be sure of our admittance to the kingdom of heaven. These things are only possible by the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who comes as the helper, who Jesus sent after him because he knew that without him that we needed help. The Holy Spirit who isn't, ooh, is not weird. And it is the wrong description, is he. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm going off piste and I really don't care. Everybody knows an orange, right? 
And an orange is made up of three parts. You've got the skin. You've got the segments. And you've got the seed. Well, all an orange, isn't it? Am I right? <laughs> wakey, wakey. <laughs> But it's the same with God, that God is the same, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At yeah. the beginning of creation, God walked with man, with Adam and Eve. He walked in our presence and we sinned. And so God had to, was pushed away, was sent away because of our sin. And later on, God goes, these guys really need help, I'm going to have to send them my son. He's going to walk amongst them. I, as God, I'm going to walk amongst them. I, myself, as God the Son, I'm going to die upon the cross because I love them. And yet he was rejected. Yeah. The religious still want to know him. Get away. Gone. So he went to heaven. God so wants to walk with us. He wants to spend time in your presence. He wants to dwell with you. He wants to help you. And so he sent the helper. Mm -hmm. The helper is there for each of us. That we might be able to fulfill the commands that he's given us. I can't do it on my own. And however great and experienced you are, neither can you. Yeah. Should we pray? Holy Spirit, come now and move amongst us. Help us where we are weak. Help us to love in the ways that you call and command us to love. Oh Lord, we need you. We sing the hymn, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you, and it's so true. And Father, we pray that you would give us wisdom and the ability to, to determine the wolves amongst the sheep. That you would help us to be a flock together, following the Good Shepherd. Lord, that we would be known to you as you are known to us. Lord, we know that in the shepherding world, the, the shepherd only has to sound his voice and the sheep know mm -hmm. who they belong to and they come. May we be so obedient to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Should we stand together and sing?